in today's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about angular momentum conservation and Kepler's laws and how those two things are connected. So this is a, a picture, a painting of Johannes Kepler. He lived from 1571 to 1630. He's a German astronomer and he's best known for developing the laws of planetary motion based on the observations of Tycho Brahe. Now, What's notable about all this and why I bring it up is because he lived from 1571 to 1630. So bear in mind that Newton wasn't even born yet uh, when he was doing his work. So that means that he made all of these observations and wrote all of this stuff down without knowing about Newton's law of universal gravitation. And yet we can link Newton's law of universal gravitation directly to Kepler's laws. And of course, Newton uh, used Kepler's data and um, his work to develop his uh, famous equations. So Kepler's laws, um, here they are, there's three of them. Doesn't there always seem to be three laws in physics? It's funny. But anyway, Kepler's first law, all planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Okay, this is based on observation, um, detailed observation, night after night. Uh, he noticed that they move in elliptical orbits. Now, what's noticeable about that is that, of course, uh, some of the planets only deviate from a circular orbit by a tiny little bit. So to notice that the planets are moving in elliptical orbits um, and not circular orbits is actually kind of an achievement in and of itself. The second law says the radius vector drawn from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time. Now we'll derive that one based on Newton's laws during this lecture, and it's a consequence of angular momentum conservation. But of course, Kepler didn't know any of that, right? Kepler's third law says the ratio of the square of the period of revolution and the cube of the ellipse semi-major axis is the same for all planets. Yet again, this is a consequence of Newton's law of universal gravitation, which wasn't around yet. So in case you need a little review, um, sometimes thinking and, and the vernacular jargon for ellipses gets a little rusty if you don't use it. So let's um, talk about ellipses just really quickly. So of course, you can make an ellipse um, on your own if you want to just take two thumbtacks um, and then tie a string to either thumbtack, and then you put a pen or a pencil, um, pulling the pen or the pencil through the string that's tied to the thumbtacks taut, then the shape that you draw out if you keep your um, string taut at all times would be an ellipse. Now F1 and F2 in this diagram are the foci, the focus of the ellipse, okay? So that's where you would put your thumbtacks. They're located a distance from the center on either side. So if you look at the complete axis of symmetry folding the ellipse one way and folding the ellipse the other way, those are the axes that we're talking about, okay? And then C is a distance um, over to the focus on either side. All right, the longest distance through the center is called the major axis. So that's from the center of the ellipse to the edge on the long axis. Now, um, the short distance through the center to the edge is the semi-minor axis, so that's B here in this drawing. So you go from the center to the edge along the short axis. So a little bit more um, jargon here, the eccentricity of the ellipse, that's usually symbolized by E, and it's equal to C over A, okay? Now for a circle, the focus is the center. Right? It would be right there in the center. So for a circle, that means that the eccentricity is zero because C would be zero. However, the range of values for eccentricity for ellipses could be all the way from zero to one. And the higher the value of your eccentricity, the longer and thinner your ellipse gets. So Kepler's law, you know, the planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Right, so let's say that the sun is here at F1, right? Nothing's at the other focus. Sometimes students get a little, you know, confused about that idea, but nothing's at the other focus. Aphelion would be the point farthest away from the sun. So it would be over here, let's say the sun is at F1, it would be over here um, at uh, past F2 on the x-axis there at a distance A plus C uh, from the uh, sun, which is over here at F1. 
Now, if you're talking about Earth's orbit, if something's in orbit around Earth instead of aphelion, they call that point apogee. Perihelion is the point nearest the sun, okay, so that would be over here where the ellipse meets the x-axis closest to f1, and the distance for perihelion is a minus c. If you're talking about something in orbit around Earth instead of around the sun, then we call that point perigee. Okay, so Kepler's first law. If you have a circular orbit, that's just a special case of the general elliptical orbits, and there c is equal to zero. Now, Kepler's first law, the fact that they move in elliptical orbits is a direct result of the fact that gravity is an inverse square central force, all right? And so if something is bound in a bound orbit um, under these conditions, then it will move in either a circular or an elliptical orbit. And of course, bound means it has not escaped the gravitational pull of the object, all right? So bound objects orbit the center in either circles or ellipses. If you have an object that can break free of uh, the sun or whatever, then it would pass by and it wouldn't return. And those paths are, are parabolic um, and hyperbolic, all right? So here is the eccentricities and other data for the orbits of the planets and Pluto. Pluto's not a planet anymore, but it's still in here to give contrast, I guess, um, for the planets and other objects about the sun. Okay, so here's the distance in AU. Remember, the AU is the distance between the Earth and the sun, right? So there's the distance between the Earth and the sun, one AU, okay? Um, it gives the period of revolution in days or years. Uh, and it also gives the uh, inclination of the orbit. So if you uh, know this, then great. If not, let me tell you, <laughs> the orbits of the planets are mostly in a plane, okay? Um, and the tilt of the orbit to that plane is usually very small for most of the planets. It's one of the things that got Pluto kicked out, quite frankly, because it's got a very large angle of inclination, and so its orbit isn't in the same plane as the other planets, all right? Um, and then finally, of course, the eccentricity, which is what we've been discussing. So you can see here that most of the planets, Venus through Neptune, have eccentricities that are very, very close to zero, which means that they're very circular, right? So the fact that um, Kepler noticed that they were elliptical is an achievement in and of itself. The only one that really deviates uh, from that would be Mercury uh, with an eccentricity of about 0.21, right? So it has the largest eccentricity of any of the planets. Um, Pluto, I don't believe uh, Kepler would have ever observed Pluto, right? That was observed and discovered much, much later. Um, but its eccentricity is larger at 0.25. Okay. So that's the first law. Kepler's second law um, sweeps out equal areas and equal times. That's a consequence of the conservation of angular momentum. So here's an important point. Gravity and other central forces exert no torque, okay, about the axis um, which connects the object of their attraction to them, okay? So if you put your, your point of interest at the center of the sun and then you draw uh, a vector for the force from the sun on the earth, then of course the uh, force vector points along that line connecting the sun to the earth. And that's also the direction that your position vector r points along the line from the sun to the earth. So in this case, r and uh, f are parallel. And since the torque is equal to r cross f, the co pr cross product of r and f, um, so that the magnitude of the torque is proportional to the sine of the angle in between r and f, since that angle is zero, then there is no torque, right? Because sine of zero is zero. So gravitational forces and also Coulomb's law forces, they're also central forces, they would exert no torque um, along the line of the attraction, okay? So since there's no torque, then that means that angular momentum is conserved because torque is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum. And so if torque is zero, then the angular momentum is constant, and that means it's conserved. So if we write our angular momentum as L is equal to R cross P, then that would be equal to R cross the momentum of the planet, right? You can move the momentum of the planet here out front because it's a constant, so it doesn't matter where you put it. And so the mass of the planet 
uh, times r cross v is equal to a constant. Okay, so the angular momentum is constant. Okay, now let's get into the nitty-gritty of deriving the equation for Kepler's second law. So remember that um, since we're doing L is equal to R cross P here, remember that the magnitude of a vector cross product is the area of the parallelogram that de R de is defined by those vectors, okay? So if you wanted to say that it sweeps out equal areas in equal times, well, here is a little diagram of that. Here's your position vector at some time, right? And then at some uh, amount of time, DT later, we'll assume that it's moved along that path, but not very far. Okay, so here we have R and then the DR, the change in the position would be along the path of the ellipse here. Okay, and then DR would be equal to VDT, the angular speed times DT. Now, of course, the angular speed of an object in orbit can change as it moves um, further away from the sun, it's going to slow down. But we're assuming that we're taking a little slice of time DT so that we can approximate that as constant, okay, close enough to constant. Now, the area of a triangle, which is what we're looking at here, the position vector would sweep out this orange, yellowy orange area here, which is triangular. And so the area of the triangle, um, if you remember your high school geometry, is one half times the base of the triangle times the height. So in that case, the magnitude of our area would be one half r times dr. All right? Now, dr is equal to vdt, so the magnitude of our area um, there would be one half r cross vdt. Now, we're assuming that we've got a small enough change here that we can approximate all this um, as a right triangle bit. So the sine theta bit there goes to one. And so here we're doing a, a little bit of algebra. If you have this dA is equal to one half r cross vdt, you can multiply by one, no problem. So I'm multiplying by m over m, which is one. Okay, so taking the magnitude there, I get on top m vr dt over two m now right? And then I can take this dt and divide both sides by it so that I end up with dA dt on the left and mvr over 2m on the right. Now, most of the planets have pretty close to a circular orbit, and so the um, value for mvr is the angular momentum, right? And so that's dA dt is equal to L over 2m, all right? So what this is saying is that if the angular momentum is conserved, and of course the mass of the planet doesn't change uh, during the time, we can definitely make that as a safe assumption, this L over 2m is a constant value, which means that the area vector sweeps out equal areas in equal times. dA dt is a constant. All right? So that's Kepler's second law, and that's the proof of it. And as you can see, it's a result of angular momentum conservation. Now, the third law says um, that there's a relationship between the square of the period and the cube of the semi-major axis. Now, this can also be derived from Newton's law of gravity, all right? But Kepler lived before Newton, so this is an accomplishment. So if you think about, let's just say, pretty close to a circular orbit like most of the planets really are, then the gravitational force, which is um, in magnitude big G times the mass of the sun times the mass of the planet, big M, little m, over R squared, where R is the distance between the sun and the planet. So we have G, big M, little m, over R squared for Newton's law of universal gravitation. And then that's equal to the centripetal force, because this force, that is the law of universal gravitation, is providing the centripetal force of the system in V squared over R. So um, if you break out that, uh, V would be equal to the speed, which is the distance divided by the time. So the distance is the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, divided by the period, um, which is the time that it takes to go around the circle one time, right? So 2 pi r over t, plug that in for V in this mv squared over r equation, and then you end up with m times 4 pi squared r squared over r t squared. So you can simplify that. Um, you can cancel out some r's, cancel, cancel out the mass of the planet on either side because that appears on both sides of the equation. And then you can just do a little bit of algebra rearranging things and solve for your period squared. And you see that period squared, t squared, is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over g times the mass of the sun, big M. Okay? 
Remember that g is Newton's universal gravitational constant, 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 in SI units, okay? And so here we've connected the square of the period with the cube of the radius, right, of the orbit. Now, if instead it's a more elliptical orbit and it deviates more from um, a circular orbit, then what you can do is you can sub in the semi-major axis A in for R, okay? Um, and so that gives you t squared is equal to 4 pi squared a cubed over gm. So that's Kepler's third law. So in this lecture, I've shown you how um, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion are caused by, are consequence of, uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation and the fact that it's a central force so that angular momentum is conserved and the fact that it's an attractive central force so that bound orbits are circles or ellipses, and also that um, since it's the law of universal gravitation, that that gives a relationship that Kepler described between the period and the semi-major axis of the orbit. All right, I hope all that was clear, and um, I'll see you around. I'll see you in class.